Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear viewers, thank you for joining us on this show. Back to the basics in which you are joining me live from the holy city of Karbala. Just to get right into the topic, there has been unfortunately a few delays, so we're going to have to just jump straight into it. So I begin in the name of Allah and I ask Allah to send his blessings upon the holy prophet Muhammad and of course upon the Ahlul Bayt. Dear respected viewers, we're continuing with our New Year's special. And this is now part three, in which we were continuing to analyze just some of the gems from the Ahlul Bayt, particularly in reference to our brief analysis of the non-theistic, atheistic position and where it leads to in regards to the human intellect. For those of you who have not been tuning in, there is way too much for me to cover in a very short two-minute summary. But there is good news. You can go back to the previous episodes and just understand the train of thought that I am utilizing. I have previously argued that those who deny the existence of God, deny the existence of a deity, an all-powerful, all-knowing creator who in his wisdom created this universe and indeed placed us upon the face of the earth, in the face of denial of such a concept, we're not merely denying a superstitious belief, but rather we are denying a very phenomenal concept which provides explanatory scope for many of the phenomenon that we observe around us. And of course, one of the main phenomenon that we observe and are even able to observe or even think about our observation, for indeed observation is nothing more than our eyes taking in certain sensory data and our minds process that data. But of course, what would you do if you didn't have a mind? that could process that data. In our previous episodes, we've been looking at how some of the modern atheist thinkers, some of their greatest proponents, some of their greatest philosophers of science, have put forward the claim that if there is no God, then we have no ability to use our mental reasoning. That is to say, we are incapable of understanding anything. Because indeed, the whole process of thought is nothing but a mere illusion. Of course, this was the main contention and the main argument put forward by the great professor of the philosophy of science at Duke University entitled, whose name, who goes by the name of Alex Rosenberg, in his book, The Atheist's Guide to Reality, in which he himself puts forward that atheism is not merely the denial and outright rejection of the concept of God, but rather it comes with a whole, as he calls it, liberating worldview and a breathtaking look at reality. He describes it as something which is really quite breathtaking and something which according to him has been quite liberating in coming to understand. So what were the consequences of Alex Rosenberg's atheistic worldview. Alex Rosenberg argues that because the only, the only facts, the only methodology by which we can understand truth, that goes back to the word epistemology which we've used in previous episodes, epistemology being a theory of knowledge and where we gain knowledge from, Alex Rosenberg states that the only valid means of knowledge, the only real facts are physical facts. And what does he mean about physical facts? He means what physics claims are facts. So an analysis of everything from the perspective of the science of physics, this is what Alex Rosenberg proposes as our research method and the only way in order to understand truth. Now, of course, where this leads is quite interesting. Rosenberg's consequences of this are that human history has no meaning or any significance. Concepts such as love are merely evolutionary processes designed with a certain intended goal, namely to find a spouse and to procreate. But more importantly, where there is no such thing as free will, 
there is no such thing as rationality because at the end of the day, thought is merely an illusion. Now, am I making this up? Not at all. I'll quote once more, he states on page 167 and page 190, since there are no thoughts about things, notions of purpose, plan or design in the mind are illusory. Welcome to the matrix. All of this is but an illusion. Why? He continues, since the brain can't have thoughts about stuff, it cannot make, have or act on plans, projects and pur or purposes that it gives itself. So, really, again, I'm going to keep batting on the head here with this particular quote and this particular concept because I need you to understand that I'm not misrepresenting Alex Rosenberg. I know that many viewers out there will be saying, oh, you're caricaturing it. Of course you are because you want to misrepresent what the atheistic position is. No, this is legitimately Alex Rosenberg's position. Is Alex Rosenberg a quack theorist out there that's not taken seriously by anyone? No, he was quite specifically asked to write a book as an introduction to what the atheist thinks about reality. And he's got a very prestigious job. This is not a modern day polemicist that sits on a keyboard and writes on the internet in online debates with theists. This is someone taken quite seriously in his profession. And so we need to accordingly understand that this is not an argument from authority. Alex Rosenberg has quite clearly laid out the framework, the premises and the conclusions and why he believes what he does. He argues that since we live in a physical universe where everything is material, there is no room for the concepts which we call thought. And he argues that like movies are played back to us from showreels, which are a set of recorded images played back in sequence so it looks like action is actually going on in front of us. Our notion of thoughts are likewise a similar delusion and illusion which our minds have interpreted that way. What does this tell you about what the brain is for the atheist? And what does it tell you when we state that they don't believe in free will either? What it tells me is that for those of you who engage in online debates with them, we should really just take the principle of the Imams, Qa'adat al-Ilzam, which the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have given us, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, and we should say, look, according to your worldview, I don't even have a free will in what I believe because there's no such thing as free will. According to your worldview, I don't even think about anything because there's no such thing as thought. Therefore, instead of arguing with me about what I believe, how about you just accept that according to you, I'm pre-programmed by the series of events that came before my life and where I am today to act in the way I do. Me being a believer is just a series of previously caused physical events. And likewise, you being an atheist is not a rational choice either because there's no such thing as thought. So you know what? There's probably no point in having this dialogue and if you get angry with me for saying this, then I'm saying this because that's just the way the previous events before that led to what I'm doing now have led me down. This is the appropriate way to deal with such arguments. As I've mentioned before, it's funny for me because anyone who has generally looked at these issues before, they would understand that yes, if we were to look at the world from a purely physical perspective, there are no good reasons to assume that there's free will. There's no good reasons to assume that we have consciousness. There's no good reasons to assume that there's such a thing as morality in a godless physical universe. There's no such thing as, again, well, vo those things will suffice for now. But the fact that I do have free will the fact that I clearly can think and I'm engaging in a thought process by speaking at the moment and thinking about what I'm saying before I speak should go on to show that clearly we don't live in a purely physical world which is godless. But instead of doing that, instead of saying that, wow, 
if this universe were purely a godless physical universe, these things wouldn't exist, therefore there's a god. These individuals start off with the other assumption, which goes like this. Well, because there's no god, therefore, I don't have the ability to think, I don't have a free will, there's no such thing as morality. Great. We can really see what that's doing for you, and we can really see how, if you tune into yesterday's episode, we discussed the livability of such a worldview. If such a thing could ever be possible, could we really govern the world with such assumptions? Now, of course, the atheists will get very angry when they hear me saying these things, and they'll say that I'm strawmanning them. But again, I have quoted in several episodes now that this is not merely Alex Rosenberg saying that we can't trust the intellect. These are prominent atheist thinkers, and none of them are schoolboys in their particular fields. In fact, I would say that these individuals would likely be cited more by the individuals I debate with online as an authority in the field of academia and in the field of the uniqueness of human thought and in the field of recognition of individual thinkers more than the average person I debate on the internet. And so I throw that challenge out right now. In fact, I would say they're far more qualified to discuss the implications of modern day scientific theories and the implications of our understanding of the facts than the individuals I debate with online. But at the same time, I can understand their frustration because human experience in its entirety points out that we do have free will. It points out that we do have the ability to think and it points out that there is such a thing as morality. As I've said, livability and the synchronization between our worldview and human innate nature is something very, very important. But if you want to bite the bullet and if you want to take the blue pill tonight and argue that there is no God, then really, if you're willing to believe that you can't trust your mind for anything, I don't know what else some quack doctor used car salesman would be able to sell to you. Because if you're willing to sell, if you're willing to buy a product which, which essentially tells you you're, with all due respect, deficient in your mental faculties for buying this product, then why would you buy the product and degrade yourself? Now, some people would argue that this is me appealing to emotion, but I believe I'm appealing to human experience and reason. Dear viewers, please, let's go for a short break and we'll come back shortly after that. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear viewers, we were saying before the break that you have this trend of honest atheist philosophers of science who are stating that yes, let's look at the consequences of what a world would look like if it was purely physical and it had no creator who endowed beings with the faculties they have. And they've stated that look, we'd have difficulty explaining morality in fact, we wouldn't be able to explain consciousness. We wouldn't be able to explain the process of thought because thought is not something physical. We wouldn't be able to explain the process of free will. Now, the average person would hear this and say, wow, okay, well, that's interesting. That, that's what a universe would look like if there was no God. Well, fair enough, there must be a God because clearly I, have mora I, I believe morality exists. I do have free will. I do have rationality, and I do have consciousness. But instead, these individuals choose to play Russian roulette and argue, well, but we're starting off with the assumption that there's no God, therefore, my thought process is just an illusion. My belief that I have free will is likewise an illusion. Morality is likewise just something we made up as human beings to make ourselves feel better. Really? This is what you want to offer the world? And you can see why many of us 
think that there's a lot of intelligent people out there who are willing to believe in something which is, quite frankly, absurd, and their own very human nature and decency tells them that it's all wrong. And that is why I wanted to refer this back to the narration of the Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam, which goes along the following lines. It's very famous and it's cited in numerous different ways. The most prominent of them, of course, is Man arafa nafsuhu faqad arafa rabbahu. Whoever knows himself, knows his Lord. This is of course a narration attributed to Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam. And there are some who have reservations about it, but at the end of the day, it's in line with the Quran. And as long as it is interpreted in the right manner, it is a very sound narration. It is affirmed by a narration found in Sheikh Atusi's book, Al-Iqtisad, narrated from the Holy Prophet ﷺ, who states, A'arafakum bi nafsihi, a'arafakum bi rabbihi. Whoever knows the most about himself would of course be in more of a position to know about his Lord. Now, I will distinguish that there are two different types of ma'rafa here. And we mean ma'rafa in a more general sense. We mean in the sense that we know we have a creator. We know we have someone who oversees our affairs. We know that there is a sustainer of this universe, someone that brought us about into existence. Of course, one of the reasons that many people have objections to this narration, just to point out, is the fact that it has been heavily utilized by schools of thought which are not in line with the pure Tawheed of the Qur'an, nor are they in line with a pure understanding of the Qur'an given to us by the Ahlul Bayt alayhim as -salam. This work which I have between my hands here is a very important work. It's called Rusalat al-Khurasaniya fi sharh man arafa nafsahu faqad arafa rabbahu of Samahat al-Shaykh Muhammad ala bi khamsin al-Ahsai rahmatullah alayhi. He cites in his book all the different explanations and just so I'm not misunderstood let us talk about the understanding which we want to ensure the viewers do not hold about this narration. Firstly our understanding is that the understanding which I wish to extract for the purpose of this episode in engaging with atheist thought is that everyone else who knows about the limitations of human beings and about the limitations of a physical universe, through knowing more about these limitations, would understand that there is a creator God who fashioned us, and without this creator God, then everything would be absurd and we would be lacking any explanatory power to explain the way the phenomenon we see before us. Essentially going down the route of philosophers of science like Alex Rosenberg, who would rather deny that we have the ability to think, have free will, and have things like morality. But the deviated understanding of this is something put forward by someone called Ibn al-A'rabi or the one who brought death to the religion, Mumit al -Din. He states the following in one of his prominent books, Al-Fusus. فَأَنَا عَابِدْ حَقًّا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مَوْلَانَا وَأَنَا عَيْنُهُ فَأَعْلَمْ so I am a worshipper truly, and God is my master. So I am his I and no, and if it is not said a human being. So don't be veiled by this reality of human beings, and you've been given a clear cut proof. فَكُنْ حَقًّا وَكُنْ خَلْقًا So be truth and be creation. تَكُنْ بِاللَّهِ الرَّحْمَانَ And be by God, Rahman. Of course, one of the names of Allah Azza wa Jal. In this poem, he goes on to describe how he is both in the position of the servant and God at the same time. Now, such words, we could normally try and find a decent explanation for them to prove why they are deviated, why they are misunderstood. But in such a case, we are not able to. Now, 
My point here is not to bash any historical individuals. Truly, I, I think we're beyond that point. I think that for me to bash the thoughts of one individual is really not going to do much help on this show. And indeed, we're trying to find truth. We're not trying to find people that have missed the truth. Rather, all I wanted to do in conveying this particular point of information is to state that this understanding of the narration is not the understanding of the narration that we are going for in tonight's discussion. Of course, another one of the great ulama of today, Sayyid Muhammad Taqi al-Madarasi, he states in his book, Mabada al-Hikmah, that there are two different types of ma'rafa. What are the two different types of ma'rafa? The first type of ma'rafa is the one I pointed out. That Allah Azza wa Jal is our creator and that Allah Azza wa Jal has created this universe and that we have a mudabbar. We have someone who oversees and controls this universe. We have someone that brought it about into existence and someone that provides us with rizq. Someone that has essentially brought this universe into existence from non-existence. That we are limited and there is a creator for us. This type of ma'rafa is of course something we can attain through the aql. So again, this would be very true that whoever knows himself in this sense and knows about himself by utilizing his aql and understanding that he is limited would of course know his Lord. But there's a second type of ma'rafa which I don't wish to convey that we can have an understanding of without the grace of Allah Azza wa Jal. And that type of ma'rafa is not something which we gain through the aql alone. As I've stated, the aql, the intellect, can give us that more general type of ma'rafa. But the more specific type of ma'rafa is, of course, the ma'rafa which comes from Allah Azza wa Jal Himself. And this is, of course, in reference to the great supplications given to us by the Ahlul Bayt, which states about Allah Azza wa Jal that he is he who indicated to himself by himself. That Allah Azza wa Jal, he is the one who made himself known to us. And what do we mean by this? We mean that Allah Azza wa Jal, in his infinite knowledge and in his infinite wisdom, has given us the faculty known as the fitrah. The fitrah is that faculty which Allah Azza wa Jal has given us in order to make us more and more aware of His existence in addition to giving us the ability to understand truth when it comes to us. And that is why the Qur'an is referred to as a dhikr, the reminder. The Qur'an is not merely an abstract book which is here to teach us a series of entirely new facts which we were completely oblivious to before. Rather, the Qur'an is a book which talks about the signs of Allah. And we find that the Qur'an is a book which resonates with our human innate nature, this nature known as the fitrah, especially when the Qur'an is interpreted by the interpreters of the Qur'an, and by them I mean the Ahlul Bayt, If one is to interpret the Qur'an using the Hawa, of the first generation of Muslims who betrayed the prophets, or some of them betrayed the prophet, that's not to say all of them, a great number of them stayed with the prophets. Then of course it's a different case. But dear viewers, we're gonna to have to come back to this topic at a slightly later point. I thank you for joining me once more on this show. show. Back to the basics, please don't forget us in your dua. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.